Uh, I will present three different ways uh, to think about lifelong learning. First, we have the everyday use, uh, when we talk about lifelong learning as a sort of a general co concept in our language. We talk about learning from cradle to grave throughout life. Uh, but if we look at policy, lifelong learning has been a policy concept for a long time, since the, at least since the 1990s. Uh, and both on a European level, but also in Sweden. If we, start, if we look at Sweden, it started in the 1990s where we had something we called Kunskapslyftet, the knowledge lift. It was a really uh, big effort from the government to support uh, education uh, for many people. And the reason was that there was a lot of unemployment in the 1990s. So they wanted people to get a new education so that they could get a job. And it was primar primarily uh, upper secondary education, not higher education, uh, vocational education. <coughs> then, uh, in, the, in the 21st century, the policy concept changed a little bit because we started to get a lot of immigration to Sweden. And the people who came here had some were illiterate, they could not read uh, and write. Others had higher education degrees, maybe even doctoral degrees, but they didn't know how to speak Swedish. So then lifelong learning became about how do we get these people to have the education so that they can enter our society. And then for the uh, last few years, uh, lifelong learning has become a concept for higher education. Uh, and uh, we talk a lot about how higher education can be a, an actor in the lifelong learning system. Uh, and I will get ba uh, back to this and give an example of why I will mention a, an organization who have worked a lot with this. It's because there's a lot of people white collar workers who realize that they will not be able to stay in their profession throughout their life. Works will change, some, <coughs> some professions will disappear. So they realize that we will have to uh, continue to educate ourselves or maybe even shift work during our lifetime. So there's a lot of pressure on how, how wh what can the state or what can our education system offer us to be able to do this. Uh, we also have lifelong learning as a research field or a research concept. And I will get back to that when I talk about the theories of lifelong learning. But first I will give you also a very common way to define lifelong learning. It's to talk about formal, non-formal and informal learning. Formal <coughs> learning is what we do here. We have teachers, we have criteria to enter the, the education, you have to apply for it, it has a curriculum, you have different levels, it's very structured. Uh, then we have non-formal learning. It can be a study circle, for example, where you gather a group of friends to learn about something. It, uh, it can be working with a tutor or a mentor. It can be competence development at, at work, where you want to solve a problem and you have to learn something to do that and you get a group, a community of practice or something like that at work. Uh, it can also be, uh, and then we have informal learning. The learning that is going on all the time. Uh, when we encounter something that we don't know, maybe we Google to find out what, what does that concept mean or what is that. And we, and we learn something all the time. And uh, sometimes it can be conscious that we want to learn something, we may learn Spanish on our own, going to Spain for example, or going to Germany, or uh, doing something just to learn, uh, but it can also be something that just happens in our everyday. Uh, and now I said I will present this Swedish system for lifelong learning, it's mainly the formal as, uh, part of learning that we will talk about when we look at this system. This is an, a picture from the Swedish National Agency for Education. And if we start with the younger kids, we have preschool education. Then we also have uh, after school programs, fritidsverksamhet. 
we have compulsory schools. Then we can continue to um, upper secondary high school, gymnasieskolan. We also have uh, adult education. And adult education in Sweden today is uh, a two big parts is basic education for adults. Those coming to Sweden that are illiterate and have to start school from scratch. Uh, but we also have uh, uh, upper secondary high school. It's very common in, in adult education. Uh, and there are almost as many people in the adult education system as there is in the upper secondary school system. But they are a little bit different in how they are structured. Then we have Folkai schools uh, that also offer adult education, but folk building is as an idea. The education in folk building is supposed to be uh, voluntary. You go there, you, you can take initiatives. It's, it's very much about the individual, meeting the individual where that person is at the moment and moving forward. Uh, and then we have higher education, universities, uh, and as we see in Sweden, Universitet och Högskolor, and also vocational higher education. And this is what the traditional way of moving in the uh, school system looked like. You started, of course, when you're little, you're in pre uh, preschool, uh, but this, it was sort of an idea that you moved in a straight line. And it was not many years ago that actually politicians were talking about that we have to get a solid education and it would have to be done at age 23. And then we should go out in working life and perform the rest of our lives. And this is something that really has changed over a couple of years, maybe five years. Uh, and today I would say that we think about lifelong learning system is more like this, it's a network. Uh, moving between these different uh, forms of schools, depending on your needs at the moment. Uh, also depending on where you're at in life, do you need to change work completely? Do you want to move from one profession to another? There are also other education actors that you could uh, uh, go to. Uh, so just moving in a totally different way today. So, uh, so we're here at at university, we're not the end station anymore. We're one of many players in the education field. Uh, this is European statistics. Uh, uh, people in the different European countries answering the same question that you just did. Have you participated in education and training, annual training? And uh, this was statistics from 2017. It's Eurostat st statistics. Uh, people aged 25 to 64, and it's based on two different surveys. And the uh, average in, in the EU is that temp almost 11% said that they had participated in training. In Sweden, uh, it's almost, well, it's about 30% who said that they had participated. So you're above average which I'm glad for because I think that people working at, in a higher education institution <laughs> should continue to uh, also participate in, in education all the time. And as you can see, Sweden has the highest number. Uh, and we're known in Europe for having a good system for lifelong learning and for participating in education and learning. These are, the orange staples are the same as the previous one and then the blue ones are uh, the same question, but have you participated uh, the last year in education and our training? And uh, then the European average is about 45, which is quite high still, I think. Uh, and in, in uh, uh, Sweden, it's about 64%. Switzerland is the country with the highest rate of, of participation in education, with almost 70%. But they're not a EU country, so they're on that side of the picture. Just to get an idea about participation, and, but also to, to 
uh, know that there are statistics about this if you want to, to go out and compare the different countries. And Sweden is number two here, so we're, we're good uh, in, in this area. Uh, now I'll talk about lifelong learning and adult education theories. I will give you uh, three examples uh, of lifelong learning and adult education theories. And the first one is not really a theory, but a person. It's Peter Jarvis, professor at the University of Surrey in the UK. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away last year, so he's no longer with us. But his books and his writings are still with us. Uh, and he has been writing a lot about lifelong learning. Uh, a key figure in the field. And this picture is actually from uh, Granna. He's looking out at the Lake Vettern. He was part of our senior council. Uh, he loved traveling around, meeting people around the world. Uh, uh, and he was here several times. And really so, that kind of person that is an inspiration. Just uh, having fun, wanting to learn, wanting to meet new people. And his idea was that uh, Learning must be approached from a holistic perspective. It's not just about how your brain works, it's not just about the classroom, it's not just about the curriculum, it's a whole, it all comes together. Uh, and he also thought that we learn as individuals, but we learn in a social context and we adapt to our environment. And that is something also for us working here at the university to understand that to see the students as part of a social group and also we provide an environment for learning. Yeah. Peter Jarvis also talked a lot about learning for life, not only as learning skills, uh, but also to learning to be a citizen, to, to be able to learn about yourself so that you as a person can develop not only in relation to your work, but, but as a person living a life and being a person in, being a citizen in society as well. And he built on the experiential tradition of learning, uh, based sort of hands-on experience of learning. Uh, and this is also the assumption in andragogy, which I will mention. But Peter Jarvis was also interested in existential aspects of educational learning. And I will, the final third example that I give will be uh, bringing in existential aspects in education. But first, andragogy. Uh, this is in research, not a very trendy theory. It was developed in the 70s and in the 80s by Malcolm Knowles. Uh, but it's a very hands-on theory. It's at least I think, you can apply it directly to your education. Uh, and especially when working with adults, but some principles may be applicable to younger students as well. Um, and the first one is to have a clear purpose with the course, which I hope everybody who is teaching has. Uh, but also to talk about this purpose to the students, to tell the students why are we learning about this, how, why are we doing the different things in the course and how will it all contribute to the main purpose of the course? Uh, then we have, we have learning builds on experience. And especially when you're working with adults in working life, they have so much knowledge, knowledge so much experience. How do we build on that when they come to us for, for a freestanding course, for example, or uh, taking a master's here, here at Jönköping University. It can also be, we may also need to address it as unlearning. Do they have habits or skills that, uh, in, that uh, restrict them from continuing to learn or to learn something new? Adults should also be responsible and involved in the planning of instructions. That might be harder for us here at higher education because we have the strict curriculums and we have to work with them in, in a certain way. Uh, but we could introduce moments or parts of the course where they actually could be participating or choosing what to do at, at special uh, areas in the course. So work a little bit with flexibility and participation in the course. 
course. Subjects should also have relevance for work and our personal lives, and I think that emphasizes as we live longer and we work and we start to be more picky about what we learn, we want to learn things that are really important to us and that we have use of. Uh, and, and that aspect emphasizes our life. And then the last one, problem-oriented learning, is also an, an principle that is very good for adult education. Uh, and especially since we're here at the School of Engineering, I would like to emphasize that problem orientation is not necessarily the same as problem solving. Engineers love problem solving, to jump <coughs> to conclusions, I was about to say, but to jump in and try to solve uh, the problem. But problem oriented learning can also be open ended learning. It doesn't have to be to find an answer but to work with the problem and see different ways to solve this problem. And then the final and third example, the existential aspects of learning. To deal with our existence, our beings in education, not only to see a course as a subject, but to realize that both we as teachers, but also the students, are living in education. This particular theory that I like very much is developed for older adults learning, but I will connect it to also to younger adults learning. The first aspect is corporate reality. Uh, what is the meaning of body when we, in our education? Uh, for older adults, it can be about a natural decline and how you deal with that when you participate in education. For younger adults, it could also be that you have disabilities, but also that we, we're not the same every day. We're not the same in the morning as in the afternoon. How do, how do we sort of think about body in education? The next dimension or aspect is relationality. We are also part of a social context. We're, we're in social relationships. And we're also in social relationships in education. And as teachers, we know this. Sometimes we use it. We put together groups and we have different exercises where they're supposed to, to work together. But also to think about that this is not only a skill again. It's, it's also a be, part of being in education, being part of a social context. Uh, the third is speciality. Uh, it can be both physical and mental space. Do we limit or do we uh, broaden our physical and uh, mental space? I hope that, for example, theories and books can be ways to broaden our mental space. In books we can travel without moving. Uh, but we could also move physically uh, in education. We could do a study visit at a company, for example. Uh, go out, uh, use the room in a different way to move around uh, using space in education. Temporality in this theory is about integrating past, present and the future. For older adults, you, you do this Natural. Most people do this naturally, start to look back and integrate it, what, what, where am I now, maybe coming to a close, and then what is my sort of summary for future generations. Uh, when you're young, it's only the future, uh, but I think that as educators we could uh, integrate the past in education. It's very important to have historical knowledge, although the subject is not history, to have a, just to look back a little bit on, on your topic. And the final aspect is materiality and how do, you, how do we use materials in education? How do, do we use objects to learn? Uh, but materiality could also be the immaterial aspects. Uh, what is the meaning of status, for example? Uh, do students perceive teachers as being le legitimate or having legitimate knowledge? Sometimes students say, well, now, well, this is all fine, I will learn this theory, but then I will go out in the real world. That's where the real knowledge is. Uh, and 
it's interesting to think about this sort of also an immaterial dimension on how we work and how could we strengthen our authority in, in actually showing that what we do is relevant for the real world. Although we're, not, we're maybe not talking about solving a specific problem at Husqvarna, but we're, what we're doing is providing tools that could help students think about how to solve that problem. Uh, and again, the existential aspects, putting the student in the center. The student is a living being coming here, not only a brain where we store knowledge, it's a person that come here and, and participate in education. From theories about being and existential aspects to trends in society. Uh, the World Economic Forum has uh, stated four major trends that drive change in society. High-speed mobile internet, artificial intelligence, big data analytics, cloud technology. And the technological development can be exciting in itself, but it also creates challenges for us or for working life. It changes professions. We will see new professions emerge, but it will also change current professions. We will work in other ways. For example, here in higher education, uh, all these have the potential to change how we work. Uh, we can introduce new, new practices connected to these technological developments. But these drivers for change also change the competence we need. And to solve this problem, education is the solution. You should have a learning routine. Maybe set aside uh, one hour each week to learn something new. Uh, this is the drivers for change, put a lot of pressure on different companies. Uh, McKinsey Quarterly reported on the need to not, not look at retraining or reskilling, they think it's too static. Uh, not to look at lifelong learning because they think it's only connected to people who already have education. If you have, it, have education, it's more probable that you will participate in education again. Uh, and they talk about lifelong employability. I don't really agree with the authors in McKinsey Quarterly because I think employability, the concept has been problematized quite a lot and it's sort of shifting the responsibility to the individual rather than to the employer. Uh, and I still, of course, prefer lifelong learning since I work at the National Center for Lifelong Learning. Uh, the Swedish Confederation of Professional Employees has done a survey among their uh, members and four out of ten out of 10 are worried that they don't get enough competence development. And this is one of the drivers for talking about lifelong learning in higher education in Sweden. Because a lot of people with an academic degree realize that they will not be able to stay in their profession the whole life. The map uh, is an interactive map. You can find it at the Swedish Confederation of TSO's uh, webpage. Uh, and they show the access to higher education and higher vocational education. And as, as you see, the strong colors is where you have uh, access to higher education. And it's Stockholm, <coughs> the southern, southern of Sweden, and other parts of Sweden don't have the same access to higher education. So also how we can work online to provide education in the whole country is a big issue at the moment. Uh, I'm not talking about two different ways that we here at Jönköping University have to think about education is about creating the platform for learning to learn for younger students coming here taking a program their first time in higher education but also to continue to learn throughout life uh, and I think we have to work different, different with these two groups uh, we have to meet them in a different way and uh, 
Another question that I think is interesting when we look at this uh, sort of increased focus on education is to ask ourselves, will we be the only providers of higher education in the future? I think not. Uh, last year I was at a conference and this is uh, Jamie Kasep, Google's education evangelist. Google has a, a complete technology to work with education. I don't think they have content, but they have a platform for education. We, we can't use it, but in many countries where they don't have national systems, they can use the Google tools for education. This is part of their corporate so social responsibility, but you're in corporate social responsibility because you have a strategic agenda for the future. Another example is Oracle Academy. Uh, and they have a complete portfolio of computer science education resources. So they have content as well. It's all free for both students and educators. So you can use their tools as a teacher. Uh, uh, but also you can enter as a student to learn more about these different aspects. Uh, and they actually provide this to secondary schools technical vocational college, but also to four-year colleges and universities. And they uh, support more than 15,000 educational institutions in 128 countries. I had an example about uh, a course, an Oracle Academy course is sort of a structure. I will just show this picture, not go into the details. If you're interested, you can, of course, go to Oracle Academy's webpage and learn more about this. But just to uh, highlight that there are companies very interested in being an actor in the education market, so to say. Uh, how to move forward. I will just make a reference to, uh, I had a blog together with Annika, who sits here. Uh, and our blog is very much about learning in organizations, but also learning, lifelong learning in general. Uh, and we write in Swedish, but uh, the last blog post is about psychological safety. To create a envir safe environment where people can be creative, where they dare to uh, test ideas and where they dare to mi make mistakes to learn and do it right next time. Uh, this was the theory that Amy Edmondson has developed. I was going to go through it. But you also find our blog post about this, about psychological safety, but also a link to her lecture, TED lecture. I really recommend that lecture. It's really nice format for informal learning to, to look at TED lectures. Uh, and to end this talk, I would just like to say that lifelong learning is the infrastructure of tomorrow. And what will we here at Jönköping University do to be a strong player in, in that infrastructure? Thank you very much.